Maybe since I'm the organizer, I should be the presenter. Okay. Well, and it also says we're recording, so I don't know if we recorded. Can you see us now? Okay, now I'm seeing it. All right. Now, now I can see you. Yep. It's always exciting with technology. <sighs> All right. Uh, cutting edge here. Sometimes you need to blend. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of which, so you were talking about. I don't remember anymore. It must, I'm sure it was fascinating. It was. You were giving. <laughs> you were giving advice about how to work with someone who's being stubborn. Yeah, it's trouble. I mean, uh, if you have a manager who's above that person, you might have to talk to that person and say, "Hey, I think she needs to leave her. You go at the door. This should be a team effort." Yeah. Now they always do that bullshit about there's no I in team, right? But you it's, talk to me. it's it's That's a group right. effort. It reflects on all of you. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter who got the job done. It matters if the job got done. Yeah. Right? The publisher doesn't care. Your, your employer doesn't care. They just want to make sure the job gets done. If you get to the end and you say, well, this person didn't hold, hold their weight, that's for later reviews, right? Yeah. But the real kicker is hitting the deadline, no matter who's really screwing things up. Like doing your job. The important thing do is your doing job. your job. Always do your job. Try, and do, try not to take over other people's jobs, okay? Because you're making them lazy. You're, and it's not your job to do the work for them. Okay? Yes. If that's what's happening, then you need to talk to your manager and say, hey, uh, I hit my goals here, but I'm not getting the kind of stuff I need to continue on, right? Uh, and try to be judicious about it. Nobody likes somebody who's just whining and complaining, right? But um, but if it's something that's sincerely affecting the, the productivity of the team, then you need to bring it up. It should be brought up early and innocuous. Right. As opposed to accusation. And the whole communication thing again. Communicate a lot. Communicate with each other on a team and communicate with whoever is above you. Um, we've kind of got it set up so that I'm creative director here. That's right. I gave myself a promotion. So I'm, I'm creative director and they, these are all my lead writers. And yet they are also staff writers for each other. So they get to give each other assignments and... You know, sometimes they get back things that are really useful, and sometimes they get back stuff that they're kind of like, I don't know how to put this, how does this, what do I do? Um, well, that's not like real life, though, isn't it? It is. That's what I tell them. Yeah. And part of the problem, I find that uh, one of the reasons I like working on stuff and originally writing novels is that nobody can tell me what to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a great thing when you get your own fish out there and not worry about being done by anybody else. But sometimes groups come up with better ideas, right? And the TV writer rooms are a perfect example of that one. You know, they sit down, they brainstorm out an entire session, and then they, for an entire season, and then they send individuals off to write individual scripts, right? Uh, depending on which TV show you're talking about, everybody's got their own plans. But, um, what that allows you to do then is come up, you have the group that can make your plot stuff, and the individuals doing their own thing for their, their bits that they're doing, that they can be proud of and take ownership. But it's tricky to pull that off sometimes. Have to be able to be communicating with everybody all the time and not worry about whether or not you're getting your vision out there, you're getting the group's vision out there, you're right. executing the plan you come up with together as opposed to your brilliant genius, which I'm sure you have. Right. <laughs> you know, but it's, it has to tie through its own time. Yeah. And and sometimes you got to put your own stuff aside and, and do yeah. what's being asked at the moment. When you get notes back, and you're always going to get notes back, right? You're going to get notes back from somebody saying, well, I don't like this, or I didn't understand this. Sometimes the person giving you notes can be fantastic and creative and helpful. Sometimes they're going to be an asshole who doesn't know what they're talking about. And either way, if they're signing the checks, you need to figure out how to make them happy, yep. okay? Um, if, they're, if they're brilliant people to work with, you say, please let me work with you again, okay? Make sure they're your best friend. Make sure you are always working for a long-term relationship. If they're idiots and don't know what they're doing, that's your job to educate. It's your job to say, look, this I understand this, but I'm not quite sure what you meant here. Could you help me out here? Or this is the kind of feedback I really need in order to be able to move forward with direction you invest into. Right? Because yep. um, again, it's not really their fault if they don't know what they're talking about. A lot of the people you're working with in these teams are not trained writers at all. Right? You may have to explain things in the simplest metaphors that they can understand because this is new to them. And by the converse, you're probably not going to know enough about coding to be able to tell them why. You know, to, they're going to have to explain why the parameters are in place where the budgets for different levels are designed, right? So you're going to have to listen to them and trust them, too. Um, yeah. One of the tricks I've used in the past, I've seen other writers use, is use these touchstone archetypes that everybody understands. So it's like everybody's seen Star Wars a billion times, right? 
So you can always refer to Star Wars if it comes up and say, oh, not, oh, I get it, I understand how that works. But you know, don't try using Inception because maybe not everybody's seen it, right? Uh, or your favorite art film. Just right. you know, don't bother with it. It depends on your team. You get to know your team, and then you find out what you have in common, and you can refer to, oh, well, you know that thing. And exactly. I mean, yeah. when I start a game with somebody, they'll say, it's this game, which is like this game over here, but like this, right? Or it has elements of this game over here. So often, the first thing I take away from my first meeting with any team is a shopping list, right? And I go out and buy all the damn games. Yep. And it's a great excuse to play a game, right? Yeah. Um, but that way, you are all speaking the same language. Yep. They say, well, this is just like the Phoenix Wright series. And you're like, Phoenix who? What the hell? And you're like, well, okay, i got to go buy myself a DS and play this a little bit and figure out what the hell's going on. Now you buy it on the um, You know, learn the games you have a common vocabulary that you're speaking with. Yeah. And the game industry is too broad for anybody to absorb with everything. So don't feel embarrassed about it. Just go out and do your home. Yep. So we did, at the very beginning of class, we would talk about, okay, you need to go watch this movie or you need to go play this game so that you make sure that you're not accidentally copying something or that you know when we're talking about this or, hey, this reminds me a lot of that. So exactly. make sure that you're not just, you know, if you haven't seen it yet, then you you might be accidentally copying it, you know? It happens. Well, you want to intentionally copy it. <laughs> you want to you want to know when you're copying. You call that an, an, an ometer. That's right. That's right. <laughs> but at least that you know you can carry you can do ometers, you can do all sorts of different things with things. You can file the serial numbers off and make it your own. As but long you as you know. Yeah. That's the end of the day. All right. Um, I want to make sure that my class here has time to ask some questions. If you guys have questions. Hi. All right. <laughs> um, Let's see if we can make sure that you can hear. And see. Hello. Hello. Come on up closer to the screen a little bit, guys. Because yeah, I'm attached to the monitor. Well, that's not an excuse. See what I have to deal with, Matt? <laughs> Insubordination. That's right. Um, I thought that was a Deer coming across an apple. <laughs> <laughs> we just like to have wild animals in here for every class. It's a new one every class. We had a grizzly bear the other time. Crazy. <laughs> Whatever works, right? Exactly. All right. So you were going to. But um, earlier, when you were talking earlier, you were talking about giving um, giving employers uh, kind of like a. Giving them an idea of like how long it's going to take you to write something out. Um, how do you uh, how do you come up with that type of timeline? Like what, what factors into that? That's that a timeline? good question. Uh, it is a good question. The first job I had with James Workshop, they actually had sheets you had to fill out that gave an estimate of what you thought it was going to take you to do something, right? So they could budget the time properly, try to figure it out. Um, so they you know they can schedule everything out. When you're working with large teams, it's hard to do that. They have a lot of different people who are project managers. We have degree programs. We get certified for this stuff nowadays. Um, and I turned to Rick Priestley, who's the guy who designed War, uh, Warhammer, Warhammer 40,000, one of the co-designers. And I said, Rick, I don't know how to fill this thing. And what the hell do I do? He says, well, I'll figure out roughly what you think it's going to take, and then double that. And you'll probably still come up shy, but at least it'll be close, right? Because um, honestly, all sorts of shit happens that you think would not bug you. You have meetings you have to go to, life crops up, kitchen, you ask, whatever. You need to budget out enough time. And that, this is the old Scotty phenomenon where you say, of course, Kevin, it's going to take you know three days, but it really takes three hours, right? Because you want to give yourself that, that time. And if you come in early, you look like a superstar, but if you come in late, you look like you don't know what you're doing, right? Um, so the easiest way to figure out a really good thumbnail, though, is to ask people who've done it before, right? How long has this taken you before? What is the generally uh, acceptable time period in which you get this done? Or you can say to them, when do you need it by? And then... If you can manage to pull that off, then you're happy either way, right? Uh, sometimes people like to hire you by the hour as opposed to by the project. I prefer to get paid by the project. Somebody you hire you by the hour, they're encouraging you to sit around your ass a lot, right? And yes. as well as no writing isn't exactly just sitting at uh, a keyboard the entire time. There's a lot of research that goes into it. There's a lot of head scratch. There's a lot of brainstorming, all this, which is kind of hard to put down on a time clock unless you happen to be in an office. Um, so I always find it best to say, okay, this is going to take me six weeks, right? And we'll have weekly milestones, and we'll decide uh, if I'm hitting my weekly milestones, how we're going, or if we need to extend the contract further. 
Usually what happens is I end, up, I end up turning things in early to them, and they think I'm extremely fast and we're all happy. And if they start griping that I'm not doing enough work, they can say, well, if you want, I can always wait till Friday evening to turn this in rather than on Tuesday, guys. It's your call, right? Um, but that should generally you know, ask people ahead of time, see if they've done it before, and then go with your best efforts. And if you can't figure it out that way, try it for a while and see how it goes. Try it for three or four days, monitor your time, keep track of your work, count how much progress you're making, and then you can extrapolate out from there to try to come up with a better number. And you can also, uh, one of the best ways that you can learn how to do this is by practicing, but um, also by saying, I think it's going to take me three hours to do this part of it. Like, set a goal for yourself. I'm going to do this in three hours. And then do it, and then look at the clock and say, oh, it actually took me five. All right, so now I know roughly if yeah, I have yeah. to come up with a new character, it's going to take me five hours. So, yeah, it, yeah, school is a is a good practice, practice. and <laughs> especially this class, um, did you hear him say weekly milestones? <laughs> Guess. That's, that's kind of every class. Though. It is that's, every that's class. That's the way that every class is structured. We have a new assignment due every week. But uh, I actually had a question about, um, you talked about earlier um, about if you are dealing with someone on your team that's really difficult or uh, is not giving you or is not giving you helpful feedback, or you don't feel like they understand your story, or something like that. Um, and then you said that if it gets to be too bad, you should talk to a manager. But isn't that or, or uh, a you know whoever's in charge? But if you do that, doesn't that kind of hurt the relationships with people around you? Because now you've gone over their head. Well, potentially, but I mean, first you should try to bring it up with the person you're working with, right? Yeah, you should always try to be direct. With them. But be polite. Nobody likes to be told they're being an asshole. <laughs> you know, nobody tries to be told they're being difficult or that they're stupid, which is what they're going to feel like when you start bringing this up to them. Right? Um, so first, definitely try to approach them. If they prove unapproachable or they prove unchangeable, and it's affecting the project to, to the bad, uh, so that it's getting much, much worse, and it's going to affect all of you, it's literally your responsibility to bring this up to your employer. Okay? Otherwise, the project may fail. And most and of the time... you're all going to be out of work. Most of the time, your employer won't actually go tell that person, oh, so-and-so says you're impossible to work with. Yeah. They'll go to the person and say... Can't be small, this stuff can spread for you. Yeah, right. It, right. So don't say anything that you're not willing to have recorded or reported back to somebody else. But you also... Unless you say, hey, boss, let's go have a drink at the bar, and this is all confidential, and, you know, be quiet about it. But... Um, and I've done that before, too. So look, this is, we're, we're trying to work this around. We're trying to rejigger around. But um, ideally, you, you deal with the person first. Again, if you need to, you can even host like a little mini intervention with the rest of the team. So it doesn't seem like it's coming just from you. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You might consult with the other team members and say, I'm having problems with this. Is it just me? Or is there really something else going on here? Right? Because it could be that there's just some kind of an interpersonal conflict between the two of you that the rest of the team isn't feeling. And then sometimes it's me. <laughs> I have a lot of kids, and I often will tell them this. I'm like, if, if I have six problems in the day and you're involved in every one of them, the other people aren't the problem. Right? Yeah. Ooh, you're the common denominator. And also, the, if you find that you really can't, just there is some personality conflict involved there, and you just can't work with them, but you find out that so and so on the team really can work with them just fine, yeah. then. I've had it where I've like, all right, I'm just not going to work with so-and-so directly. I'm going to nope. take my ideas to this other person and they will take it to that person. And, you know, it's a little annoying that you have to have a middleman who can communicate to the two of you, but it gets the work done. And that's more important than anybody's ego. Yeah, at the end of the day, your employer cares about your product. He cares what you're producing. He doesn't really care about, or he or she doesn't care about um, the interpersonal problems. A lot of times they'll say solve it. Right? Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the management computer games, or, or fortunately, if you want to look at this way, don't have business degrees. They don't have a lot of experience with this. Often, they are game designers and such that have managed to work their way up the lab. Right? So they don't have an MBA. They don't really know how to manage people in a lot of cases, or they're learning as they go. So often, it's, it's as beholden upon you as it is upon them to try to help work these problems out. And if you turn out to be the guy who can work this stuff out, you are gold to them. Right? They will love you forever. You're the guy making their life easier. Yep. You want to be the person who's making their life easier. So if you have problems with people, what you really want to be able to do is come to anybody with a solution as well and brainstorm about that for a while. If you if you if it's just crazy and you can't take it anymore, we'll all understand. But 
if you can come up with an idea for a solution beforehand and ask maybe we could try this, you're going to look more like a team player is trying to help as opposed to somebody who's just being a problem. Yeah. All right. Other questions? We talked about. I have another one, but I want to give a chance for anyone Anybody else. Anybody else? Have a question. No, that one before was okay. Well, um, two things. One is more of a curiosity question. The other one is actual question. Question. Uh, have you ever been in a situation where? Yes. Or, yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, this might be a short answer then. Um, have you ever been in a situation where the curiosity is? Have you ever been in a situation where the whole team was just perfect? Like they worked perfectly. There were very few, if any, conflicts at all, and it's just a great like work environment. And, uh, yeah. I mean. In every, in every situation, you always come up with some problem with somebody, right? Sure. Uh, but I've been in a lot of great teams where, uh, you know, we're buddies for life, essentially. And we're, uh, if we ever see each other, we're just, it's all hugs and kisses on the street. Let's go get a beer. Um, and that's the great stuff. I mean, I, like what he was saying, I work with people that I've known for 20-some years this, in gaming, right? And some of them moved on to other industries. Some of them come back. Some of them moved on to computer games or tabletop games or back. Um, and it's just wild how things come to you. Uh, from people you haven't talked to in 20 years sometimes. Yeah. I had a guy from Games Workshop call me up. I literally hadn't talked to him in 15 years and said, hey, we have this company that's starting up a computer game for iOS. It's based upon this other game. Would you be interested in joining us as a writer? You're one of the few writers I know. Right? Yep. I, had a, uh, I had a gig working with Playmates Toys that showed up because I was the only game, maker, game uh, designer, tabletop game designer they knew, period, after they had met me five years previously. I just got a phone call on the blue. Right. Being other people's databases, their phone books, is a fantastic thing. And Neil Gaiman actually gave a commencement speech last year. He's talking about this. He says, there are three things you be able to do as a freelancer or as a creative. And one is to uh, be able to produce the stuff on time. The second is to be able to be very good at it. And the third is to be a, a wonderful person to work with. And if you, work on, if you pull off any two of those, you will go far. If you pull off all three, you will be beloved and people will hunt you down and work with you. Okay. And then the second question is, have you ever been on a team that was the exact opposite, where everybody was like butting heads and like disagreeing? And, and yes. if you were, how did you how did you deal with that situation? Because even really then, the managers because <laughs> um, even then the managers may be difficult and all that kind of stuff. You know, that's one of the reasons I like to be a freelancer. Um, it's one of the reasons I, I I have worked with. I like to be my own boss, right? So it means that I either do as a freelancer or temporarily in house. The only time I've had a job outside of that, I was the boss in the last 20 some years was the time I worked at Games Workshop for six months. And I worked for Human Head Studios for two years after we had a bunch of babies at once. My wife had quadruplets and she had to go take care of the kids. So we needed help in yeah. here. So I know. <laughs> oh, yes, he did well, definitely quadruplets. Well, yes, <laughs> Love them as I do. Good guys. But I wasn't in charge. So I was in charge of a division, though, which was nice. I was doing the tabletop division. Um, so I only really had to report to uh, one guy about it. Was, it was fantastic to work with, actually, very understanding when I screwed things up terribly. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I mean, if you have a terrible crew, you have to start thinking, you know, is this really worth it to me, right? Uh, it may be your dream job. It may be that you like the area you live in. Maybe you put every dime into coming out here. Are you going to have to uh, tough this out? Sometimes you have to say, fuck it, I can't take it, i got to get out right? Um, Ideally, you manage to work your way through it because anytime you manage to stick with the group, even if it's trouble, that's a good mark in your resume, right? That doesn't mean you can't start looking for other work while you're working with this crew if you're really not working out. And it could be that it's you, it could be that it's them, but either way, if it's that frustrating, uh, I think it's poisonous to be in a relationship like that long, a work relationship that long with people that just aren't getting along, right? Um, I was working for a company that I'm not going to name, but they didn't want to use freelancers clearly and were and needed to. And instead of doing a large in-house training program like they did, they threw us in the deep end of the pool and said, figure it out. <laughs> and it was oh, just horrible. Man. I ended up, uh, there were a few guys who came to the program after me, and I ended up coaching them through, teaching them all the stuff I had learned, because they were good people. And, you know, now I know each other. I know them. I have beers with them. My manager... You know, I'm actually friendly with him. Like we talk on Facebook, it's a good guy, but we didn't work together well at all. But if you can separate out the personal from the from the work as well, that's good. He might recommend me for something else later on, even though I probably if you'd recommended me for working with him, I'd probably decline. So. All right. That answer your question. Yes, it did. Yeah, it, I have to say that you might have missed that you blew their minds by saying that you have quads. Oh that, yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> I know everybody's like, oh, I got five kids. We've done it now.
that's not the half. Right, yeah. <laughs> so how how many kids do you have total? Wow. Yeah, we have a 15-year-old who is going to be 15 in about a week. <laughs> we stop. <laughs> <laughs> we have, uh, we Go ahead and let him talk, guys. <laughs> so Marty is going to be 15 on the 29th. He's our big gamer guy. And then we have uh, Patrick, Nick, Ken, and Helen for the quadruple. Who say hi, Mother? <laughs> I talked him out of the office for the hour and a half. I I literally say I'm I'm I do stuff like this occasionally, like podcasts and other interviews. So I just say I'm I'm recording now, guys. I actually heard them coming in here before when that we were starting. I said I'm recording. <laughs> just pretending like I was talking to Wendy, but it wasn't true. It was just somebody had <laughs> <up> the door like. <laughs> Great thing about a screen is you can cover for a second one. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're all good kids. And they're, they have a light of my own. They're fantastic. And I, I, uh, I could have been here earlier in the day, except I was, uh, ended up being at one kid's swim meet, and then we had to pick up another kid from his Minecraft club after school. And then we had to go pick up two more kids from their play rehearsal. And it just got a little mess. Sounds like you're raising them well. <laughs> so having fun. <laughs> Minecraft. <laughs> that's even better. That's a good point. Uh, just being a freelancer is wonderful, right? Which means I actually often have the time and flexibility required to help raise my kids. They need to have somebody stay home when they're sick. They need to have somebody run them to lunch they forgot. They need to have somebody going on a field trip or take them to the doctor. I get to do all that stuff. I don't have to ask anybody for time off. I keep telling them that game writing is the way to go, and they should all uh, forget their dreams of Hollywood. But I don't know if I can. <laughs> yeah, she was selling it pretty hard earlier. To be totally honest, it's, it, doesn't like it's <laughs> it doesn't seem like it's exclusive. It doesn't like it's a big stretch to go from film to video games. Well, and the other thing I tell them is that uh, you'll do one thing, and then you'll do something else for a while. And, well, and so, you guys, honestly, you'll have an easier time, right? My generation coming up. We didn't have video game writing. We were going to classes on this kind of stuff. We were making shit up as we went along. And a lot of guys who got into video game writing from screenwriting didn't even play games, right? They just had the, the fact that they had a screenwriting credit to them that got them the job. And they were just like, oh, I'll come down to Hollywood and show you how it's done. Bullshit, right? You guys grew up playing games. You know how they work. You know how they how they sing when they're really well done. So you're, you're natives that stuff. So when you somebody says you need to write film or games, you say what the hell? I can do both. I love them both. There's nothing wrong with that, right? But you won't have those preconceived notions that will force you to do one or the other. There are guys like Jeremy Bernstein, for instance, who writes for Leverage, the TV show, amongst other things, and also wrote Dead Space Two, right? And he did a great job with both. There's, yeah. there's no reason you guys can't go back and forth. Yeah. I like to have a diverse mm -hmm. um, income stream. Actually, myself, I like to do novels, comic books, toys, computer games, tabletop games. Because that way, if something dries up in one area, I have other things I can fall back on. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Amanda, you are not in the classroom. She's our one online student that showed up today. OK. Do you have any questions? Hey. 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 Um, You're in the classroom. Um, well, yeah, technically, she's, Kelsey's another one. <laughs> Let me turn this on. Do you have a question? Can I turn this on? I don't know. if he, if he Actually, he can't even see me, so I'll just turn this back off. Um, Yes, I do. I actually have uh, two questions that kind of came into my head, and one is just kind of more mystifying. But, anyways, um, the first question that I have is about um, tabletop writing. Um, so, tabletop games seem it sounds actually a little bit different than you know writing maybe for uh, like video games and for consoles and computer games, you know, like that kind of thing. So, like, I was just wondering, like, how what, what was what's the like. I guess the difference between trying to break into that and then doing working in those is there like a huge difference or is there no difference? Can somebody rephrase that for me quickly? I might make that up. Um, cut out. Yeah, Amanda, did I understand right that you were asking about how it's different to write for the tabletop games versus video games? Basically. Yes. Okay. There's there's a number of ways you're very different. One is the money. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a lot more money in computer games. They sell a lot more people than tabletop games do, with a few very, very rare exceptions. If you have any Richard Garfield or Ben Magic the Gathering, you might qualify as a very rare exception, right? Um, but most of the time, the bigger money is in computer games, which is good. Uh, but you're working with larger teams, and you have less freedom, 
when you're working with a uh, tabletop games, you can do wacky, crazy shit that nobody, anybody in a large corporation would look up and I would say, are you out of your freaking mind? Because uh, there's so much money on the line. They can't afford to take the kind of risks you can in tabletop games, right? Um, tabletop games also have uh, immeasurable freedom. Now, if you're working with something like a card game or a board game or whatever, the rules are pretty strict and they're down there. But if you're doing tabletop role-playing games, for instance, which allow pretty much infinite freedom of the imagination, uh, that's something that a computer game can never actually replicate because every element of a computer game has a budget. If you want to show something, you have to pay for it to be seen, right? You have to pay for it to be written, you have to pay for it to be voiced. Whereas if somebody says, I want to go to this part of the map that doesn't exist yet, you can just make it up as you go. It's all in your head. It costs nothing to do it, right? If you're writing for this stuff, you just leave the gray areas for people to fill in on their own. And you don't have to dictate every last step for us in a computer game. You have to put it, if it's not if it's something you wrote in there, it's not there. It literally doesn't exist, right? Um, now, as a writer, I like writing for tabletop games because it's fast, easy, and fun. Uh, and it is not nearly as rigorous. I can just say, this is kind of what I'm thinking about, and you guys can figure it out from here, right? When you're writing a, a tabletop game, you're saying, you're setting up opportunities for people to make adventures. You're not giving them an adventure themselves most of the time. But when you're doing a computer game, you're writing every element of it. You're creating every element of the team is. And there's really not a lot of room for uh, people to rip off things and do their own things with it. We have some elements that where they can create their own characters, they can do their own things. And I'm recording right now, but my wife's leaving the dog in the house. <laughs> we um, like dogs, that's fine. So that's the main difference. The dog will be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's the main difference is that uh, computer games are much more restricted. On the other hand, you're working with larger teams, larger budgets, larger audiences, so they can be much more rewarding in many ways. I mean, if you want to work out to get to a huge audience, computer games are the way to go. If you want to reach a small but fervent audience, tabletop games may be the way to go. Right? We often will compare the two to say uh, computer games are more like movies, right? They're out there for everybody. You can rent them wherever you want to. Uh, video game or tabletop games are more like going to the theater. Right? It's usually a smaller, much more intimate experience, uh, less polished because of that lower budget. Please tell me you've worked on Hero Clicks. I did I? I don't think I no, I wrote stuff for Mage Knight though, back in the day, which was before Hero Clicks. Or <laughs> I also wrote the first collectible card game that WizKids ever launched. Uh, oh, okay. Nice. Uh, which That's close that. enough. <laughs> yeah, um is it do you have to come up with like all of like the stat changes and things like that? It was a poker game. High stakes was, drifter. Yeah, now imagine that Jordan Weissman comes to you and says, I want to, poker's the hottest thing right now. I want a collectible card game that uses poker mechanics. You're like, what? Is it poker uh, already a card game? But <laughs> 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 there already was a card game like that called Deadlands, or called Doom Town, which is based on the Deadlands game being published in Pentagon City that has some poker mechanics in it, right? So I'd already worked on one of those. Dave Williams is the lead designer, right? who did Legend of the Five Rings, did a great job of it. And now Dave's with Red Five Studios on the account of his. Um, can't remember the name of the game. We've done some interesting stuff. Um, but he jumped into computer games. But Jordan says, this is what I want. I'm like, I came up with a game. We went through three different iterations. Like, this is not working at all, right? Because <laughs> it's just, there's too much variations. So eventually we decided that uh, instead of hand rakes, the most important thing about poker was not the hand rakes and such. It was the bluffing. And that's what we incorporated in the collective card game. One mechanic that would really transfer over to that better. And it ended up being a pretty good game, but Jordan actually personally apologized to me for buffing the watch. <laughs> but it was a lot of fun. I had a good time working. So the uh, oh, there's another interesting story about that actually. Okay. Uh, originally, it was called Vegas Knights with a K. I came up with an entire background for it that was uh, like these different boring magical factions, like Harry Potter in the in the Las Vegas kind of universe, right? And eventually, they decided that wasn't mass market enough, so they went with true westerns. Right, they they yeah. used uh, White Earth and, and uh, Doc Holliday and all that kind of stuff. And I said, Jordan, uh, can I have that property back then since you're not going to use it? He said, yes. And I actually sold that as my second original novel that was published like four years ago, somewhere. So don't throw your ideas away. Keep on your heart. That's right. <laughs> yeah, so one um, of the things that we do for our assignment is a twine game. You know, choose your own adventure. Yeah. 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 Um, and so that's where they're getting their experience with branching narrative and some things like that. Um, sometimes some of them are brave enough to have our guest speaker play through them and give them feedback. Would you be willing to do that? 
Uh, sure, I suppose. All right. If I, I don't think I've ever played a Twilight game. I was going to play a lot of text adventure games. But, um, if you walk me through what I got to do, sure. You know, it's just click. Make a choice and click. You can do it, I promise. Um, uh, well, we'll see if anyone's brave enough to, to send you their stuff. But uh, we'll, you know, it'll be in a few days. They, I asked them all tonight, and they were kind of like, oh, it's not ready yet. And I'm, not at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Guys, if, if you are brave enough to do something like this, I will treat it as if somebody handed me a first draft from now, OK? Which means that if we know it's a finish. We know it's got a lot of work to go. Um, and it's certainly not ready for playing time. Uh, one of the great things about doing any creative work is that until it's actually published, until it's out in the public, it doesn't count. You're, you're allowed to suck at this stage. You can screw it up the measure. Yeah. This is what you're trying things out in different ways, trying to push the envelope and see what you can do. Be brave and do that stuff. And you know, don't be afraid to fail. Yeah. It's OK. Uh, we have a saying in downhill skiing that says, if you're not falling down, you're not trying hard enough. That's right. right? That's where you find your limits. So do you uh, have a group of people that you workshop your stuff with? Nope, I don't believe in that. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I actually have a writer's group here in Wisconsin. I, I meet with all the, the illiterates, right? Yeah. Uh, and you know, all these XTSR guys, we have like Doug Niles and Troy Denning and Steve Sullivan and Rob King. Uh, and then we have a West Coast branch that includes Monty Cook and uh, uh, Bruce Cordell and uh, Jeff Grubb and a bunch of other guys, right? Um, and I, I put stuff up for them sometimes. But a lot of times I'm working under such tight deadlines, I don't have the time to farm stuff out to secondary. Yeah. Right? Yep. Um, that's number one. Number two is that at this point in my career, I'm, I'm fairly confident in what I'm doing. And I, I don't mean that to be arrogant. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, for instance, I find that workshopping, if you're talking about something where you're supposed to have a single vision, like a novel, um, can often rub the sharp edges on something, which can be good and bad. But if, you're, if it runs the cutting edge off what you're doing, then it's bad, right? If you're trying to please too many people, yeah. part of what you're doing when you're workshopping early on is learning how to take feedback from people. And part of taking feedback, feedback from people is recognizing what really is good feedback and what to throw out and move on. Yep. Right? And the only so, way to do that is to get lots of feedback and practice. Exactly. And, the, and when you're starting out, the best way to do it is get lots of feedback, right? Mm -hmm. And then if you realize that the people are saying this one thing over and over and over, then that's obviously something you need to be concerned with. Right, but if they, uh, but if you only one person says this is a problem for them, then you don't have to pay attention to them. Right. Uh, my first original novel was Immortals. I actually workshop this a little bit with my editors guys. Uh, I sent a copy to Troy Denning, who's a good buddy of mine, and Troy is Star Wars novel town is, and he kind of mentored me in doing game. Um, but Troy said he read the first chapter. He says, I don't know, it starts kind of slow. I'm like, I have a snuff film in the first chapter. I don't know how much it gets faster I can make. It. Um, and I ignored his advice. You know, as much as uh, as I trusted him and, and trusted his instincts, I said, I, I can't do it. I said, my dog is funny. Um, <laughs> we're dog lovers. It's fine. A year later, I see Troy at Comic Con. He sits me down and we're having a drink. And he says, You know, uh, I read the published edition of this. Actually, I think it was Econ here in Wisconsin. I read the published edition and he's like, Yeah, I'm glad you ignored me. You're absolutely right. <laughs> oh, thank God. Yay. Thank um, so, Part of it, you do need to workshop, especially for rolling out, because you don't know what's good, right? You're going to learn as you go. Um, and eventually, you'll learn how to take feedback and what you need to ignore and what you don't need to ignore. I get stuff back from editors sometimes where I say, no, I'm absolutely right about this in your law. But you also need to then know where to pick your belt. Right? Yep. If you fight every point, they're going to think you're a prima donna that's just fighting for the sake of fighting, and maybe you are. Um, but if you say, no, no, I really do feel passionately about this one issue you brought up. This this is why I'm what this is this is correct for me and this is why I'm correct. Yeah. And then they'll say, Oh, well if you could explain it this way, then it would be better than I would have understood, and then it's okay. And you say, Oh, okay, that makes sense. So often there's some give and take and back and forth and stuff. So it's not all, you know, stone tablets from the skies that come down and shatter and get to put them back together. <laughs> all right. That's my Catholic upbringing coming out there. I think Amanda Amanda? I should, I'm last. Okay. <laughs> Amanda, do you have another question? Good day. Um, it is time to leave the office. Oh, no. Can I guess what time it is? Thursday, November 20th. What? The time is 9 Hold on. Sorry. Go ahead. That's okay. my butler. Um, yeah, actually, the last question ended up giving me another question. I was just wondering, like, uh, okay, for, for role playing games, especially, uh, in card games, uh, you have to come up with, like, the different stats. 
um, changes in like all the kind of like the technical aspect of it. Do you is that all you doing that? Like, do you basically come up with the system, or do you work with somebody to come up with the system? Do you just come up with the setting? All right, I'm not sure you can hear that. I've got to get any of that. Okay, so she's asking how much of the design, like stats and things like that, you end up doing, especially with card games and tabletop right. stuff. How much of the design, the systems design, do you do, and how much do you work with somebody else to do that? It depends. It's yeah, because especially like in games like White Wolf, it sounds right. like... Right. Go ahead. <laughs> she was asking about specifically White Wolf. Oh, <laughs> it's just because. Oh no, no, no! I know, I know. And I was actually going to say Deadlands too because, uh, like, um, for uh, Ghost Stories, which was one of their first New World Adventures projects. Um, and but, see, but I've, I've had more beers with them than I've had books with them. Let's put it that way. <laughs> uh, well, you know, that's okay. Again, I think, well, I'm going to go off track here for a second. Talking about networking. Networking should be something where you're, you're happy to have beers or whatever. Dinner, uh, a soda, whatever. It doesn't have to be beer, coffee. Just a chance to get to know people and talk to people, whatever. And you shouldn't have the pressure on what am I going to get out of this? When can I get work for you guys? Right? It should be how can we get along? And then when the right opportunity comes along, we will find a way to reach each other. Right? And sometimes that's also has to do a little bit of advertising. They need to repeat this experience so that they remember you when the time comes up that they need someone. Right? Twitter is great for that. Now. You can always be in everybody's faces. Hi, remember me? Um, that's what you need to do. So with White Wolf, uh, they often would job out books, for instance, to several different people, and then have their line developer stitch them back together in some kind of Frankenstein hole that they would hopefully, you know, uh, plaster over and make it look like it's going to be one whole piece of the end. Uh, later on, as they learn, and this is the way a lot of companies do that. Uh, later on, as they learn to trust people, they often give a person, one person, an entire book, right? Especially if they're not under a deadline, you know, they know they got them time to have one person write this thing. And screw it up, they need to hire another writer. And then they'll give it to some one person. And then you get a lot of autonomy. Um, and again, depending on the company, with White Wolf, they would often say, we want something like this. Uh, when I worked for uh, TSR, writing D&D &D stuff for, for Wizards of the Coast, they would often have me something say, this is a page way. We want two pages on this topic, two pages on this topic, one page on this topic over here, four on this topic over here. And they were very specific. Um, but if you're talking about doing tabletop games like collectible card games or board games or these kind of things, often they'll job those things up. They'll break down the, uh, the job into different components and give those different pieces. So you might have one person doing the background, the color text. You might have another person doing the card mechanics. Another person actually handling the art direction, drawing an entire artist, describing them, what needs to be on each card. Uh, because these become very large jobs. In small companies, you often wear several hats at once. So you might be the writer and the art director, or the writer and the card mechanics guy, or the print buyer, even, or the sales managing guy, or the president of the company, or the guy who's packaging the boxes. You might be all of these people. Uh, the larger the company, the more they tend to break up and, and uh, silo these different responsibilities. But in smaller companies, which most tabletop companies are, they have a lot of lending. And if you have to be multi talented if you have a lot of these things, go find work one way or the other. I started out in tabletop games as an editor, actually, because there weren't many people who had proper grammar and spelling skills that also knew about games. Right? So I was in uh, I was in good demand, and it was a lot easier for me to break into the industry as an editor than it was as a writer. But as an editor, I was then able to develop a relationship with mm -hmm. the, uh, the people who were sourcing out these jobs to people and hiring us. And I'd say, well, I'm doing everything, but hey, I have to write this for you. Well, and I ended up working the writing portion with people as well. And I think I need to point out now that they do expect writers today to have grammar and spelling, <laughs> and you usually don't get an editor. Um, no. So. Exactly. the most qualified person. Which is a point that I try to tell some of our classmates. You're lucky somebody else will that proofreading before it actually goes to the market. If That's you're right. lucky. But a That's lot of times that. you'll find your typos showing up in the published game going, oh no, like I should have seen that four times. I looked at it over and over again. And why did that show up? But, but this is the reason we have people like Cameron Harris out there who are professional game editors, right? Yeah. Uh, because you need to have a second fresh pair of eyes on it. It's very difficult to edit yourself, yeah. especially under the gun, especially if you have to have enough space between when you wrote it and when you're supposed to edit. Um, it, you just become too close, but you don't see the error. 
right? And so we have the fresh eyes who's never seen this stuff before to come in and give a cold evaluation of it that's invaluable to a team like that. And I think more game companies should be doing that stuff. Some of them do a very good job in Blizzard, for instance, got an excellent set of evaluations. Yeah, that's true. All right, I think we need to wrap it up for everybody concerned. My my class here is like, oh my gosh, it's 904, 906. No, I'm, I'm giving guys <laughs> Yeah. Um, None of us are like that, just for the record. <laughs> not at all. They're all packed up and ready to hit the door. Uh, okay, I'm just. I'm packing out. now. I just hope I can. <laughs> 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 so, any last questions, ideas, comments? Okay. And do you have any last words of advice for them as they want to break into the industry? Listen to Wendy. <laughs> Say that louder. Listen to Wendy. That's why I'm not going to be successful. What did you say? One thing I would tell you is it's really something you're proud about. Persevere, right? The people end up looking for a good job in this and sticking with it for a while. So the people want to say, This is important to me, okay? Yeah. Don't let yourself get abused by employers. Don't let themselves, don't let them force you to come in and crack down or anything like that. But stick with it and persevere. Be a reasonable person to work with, and you can go a long way. Yeah. And um, don't serve your name you. And another piece of advice I give is don't wait for anybody to give you permission. Just go out and do it. Because you, yeah. you can make a game now with you and your buddies or just by yourself and yeah. get the general idea out there. And sometimes that'll lead to way bigger things, but it definitely shows that you're capable and willing to do stuff and yeah. Yeah, instead of just talk about it. Travel together with your buddies might be something that turns yeah. into a massive MMO or a film or something like that. Just start with something that fits your yeah. vision and, and, and inform your vision for platform work. Give you all sorts of things. Yep. Well, thank you very much, Matt. I will pass along. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Applause sign just showed up. Yes. Um, I'll pass along links to to anybody's work that is brave enough to get your feedback. And uh, thank you very much for spending an hour with us today. We'll maybe have you back another time. And uh, thanks a lot, Matt. I'll All see right. you later. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye. I want to be that guy's best friend. Yes, you do. He seems like That's a really <laughs> well awesome put. guy. Well put. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Uh, and when you have a question, I just realized that you have a MacBook Air. Yes. How would you, because I'm thinking about sometime in the